We're going to switch now to talking about another group that's using storytelling as a solution, the Redford Center. I'm here today with Jamie Redford, the co-founder and chairman of the Redford Center, Jill Tidman, the executive director of the Redford Center, and Laura Nix, a director, writer, and producer whose film, Inventing Tomorrow, was one of the center's first grantees. So I'm gonna jump right in and start with you, Jamie. What, um, what can you tell me about the problems that you saw that made you wanna co-found the Redford Center? And, and what did you see as the solution or solutions? Yes, well, you hit the key word, solutions. Um, I think it was about maybe 15 years ago or so, you know, around the time the Inconvenient Truth came out. Um, you know, it, that was a watershed moment for all of us, obviously. It was a sort of a, a wake-up call that a lot of people heeded. Um, what followed was a string of really important, informative documentaries that were, frankly, a lot of them hair-raising, alarm bell-raising, concerning affirming the risk of, of climate change and the further degradation of our water and air. And it was really encouraging to see that issue coming up more and more in documentary film and media. Um, at the same time, um, I think I felt, as did my father, that there was a niche there that was not being addressed, which is solutions. And pretty quickly what was happening was there was a sense, we were getting a growing sense of what the problem is without a really um, a clear sense you can actually respond to the crisis or do anything about it. And for me, uh, I've been making documentaries for over 20 years. I'm currently in the middle of my 10th right now. And I found that, um, you know, over time that I like to make films that, that can serve as a tool for change. And we felt that uh, using the artist through the storytelling and reaching out to the public with not only stories that, that, that explained and outlined what the problem were, but, but led to some uh, potential for response and success and some success was really important because the message was getting, frankly, from my, this is personal, was, was getting a little daunting. It was, it was beginning to feel hopeless. And so, you know, we felt that there was a need to, to fill a niche of storytelling in which we could help the public understand the problem, but also help them understand that there are things we can do. And that's a challenge as a filmmaker. Um, it's very, as you say, ringing the, and I've made them. I've, I've made a number of documentaries that required you to ring an alarm bell, plain and simple. But the Redford Center is focusing on helping the public engage in this issue and not turn off due to the sense of helplessness. So many of our the topics in our films are tough, but usually there's a there's an underlying there, a layer there that helps the people understand that there are things to be done and good work to be done. And so that was really our start, plus the fact that uh, you know this is in, indeed a you know a tribute a legacy to my father's many many decade works in the environmental field and it's our way of sustaining his effort into the future as well it's very important to both him and I and I'm so interested in that legacy and those solutions and I want to jump to Jill and ask because documentaries are not the only uh, work that the Redford Center does so Jill if you could tell me a little bit more about some of the other work that you do Sure. Yeah. So we we have historically been making and investing, making our own and investing in long form documentaries. But we are more and more knowing that you know those films take years, um, and we don't have that many years at this point. We've been given a ten year ticking clock, and so um, we've been uh, branching into schools, doing a lot of work supporting young people and becoming the storytellers that we need. And you know they're that young people are so effective right now, um, more effective, I think, than many other strategies that the environmental movement's employing. But uh, we're working at the middle school level right now and doing a racial, environmental and racial justice curriculum this school year where we're exposing them to film, but we're also inviting them to become storytellers. <clears throat> we also do, um, do work with other genres. We have a couple different ways we support 
artists telling the kind of stories Jamie just described. And so uh, when we when we bring a project into the organization, we give what we call wraparound support, which is you know everything from sometimes funding to promotional support, advice. Um, we do a lot of relationship building because we sit in this interesting space of being part of the independent filmmaking community as well as the environmental justice and advocacy um, world. And so we do a lot of work trying to marry, create marriages that really work where there's organizations looking for these really important organizing tools, um, communications tools, educational tools, mobilizing tools. And then there's also, you know, storytellers that are really looking for deep expertise and um, story leads and, and other things. And so we have a really unique place that we sit um, in that in that world. And more and more, you know, as we as the organization grows and more more artists and storytellers come in to the fold for us, we feel really clear that we're creating an incredible supply of story. Um, and and what we're moving into now is trying to really create more of the demand and trying to really influence the entertainment industry, frankly, to um, do what they can to curate more of the kind of stories Jamie's talking about so that people do see their their opportunity to to get involved. Um, and that's what a lot of these stories do is they both make the invisible issue of the environment, which sometimes is really hard to detect. They make those issues, they bring them to light in a way that they become relevant um, to a, a far greater group of people and a much more diverse group of people. Um, I would say the other way that we're really moving, the direction we're moving in right now is looking at, you know, how do we redefine what it means to be an environmentalist? Um, the, the word itself and the movement has a really, there's a lot of baggage there. There's a lot of history that needs to be dealt with and addressed. And I think there's a feeling um, that if you aren't a perfect environmentalist, that you can't be part of, of this effort or that it, it's, there's no invitation um, to, to be part of it. And so part of what we look for when we pick up stories is stories that can, can kind of seem, they can debunk the myth that you have to be a perfect environmentalist that has a certain kind of education and, um, and understanding and behavioral practice to be um, a, an important part of the solution. So there's some really interesting new stories coming out. Um, we just selected our, our new crop of grantees this year, and I think we're going to surprise a lot of people with the kind of stories that were that were really clear are environmental stories um, that might not um, that other people might not think are. Yeah, I want to get into that storytelling a little bit more and those sort of misconceptions that you're mentioning, Jill. Um, and I thought I'd ask Jamie, um, what what do you think? in general, the public gets wrong uh, with on the narrative about climate and the environment more broadly? Well, I think um, I think there's a, a bit of a problem with black and white thinking. <clears throat> I think, um, let me put it this way, if you think that the goal is for us currently to uh, prevent um, man from having an impact on, on nature, if you think that the wildlife, for instance, is to be protected and can still remain, um, you know, un untouched and pure and pristine in this age that we live in, um, I think that leaves you feeling pretty hopeless about climate change because it's happening. And we've entered in a, in a time in which it is undoubtedly true, based on, believe it or not, science. Um, that we are making a difference and we are having an impact. So if you think that the goal is for us not to do that, then it's too late, right? Because we, and, and that spurs a kind of hopelessness in the public that think that it, climate change is either happening or it's not, or we're gonna lose or we're gonna win. Um, in fact, the truth is, is that no matter what's going on, we need to accept responsibility for the world we have created. This is our world now, and we have impacted it. And I think there needs to be a fundamental shift from the idea that um, we are somehow, um, you know, either going to win or lose in this thing. Rat, and when we really need to embrace the role as stewards, we need to understand that we have altered 
this climate. And it's up to us now to take as good as care of it as we can. Once you acknowledge that it's our job to step up and do what we can, then the door opens up to all kinds of things. Because there's all kinds of things you can do that are gonna lessen the impact. And I think the public somehow fails to understand the nuance there. Um, and we need to step up because everything that we do positive has a net effect. There's no reason for us not to be facing our responsibility and lessening the impact of climate change. And if the public really understood that, I think they would feel more engaged. So I think that's a real, that's a missing ingredient for a lot of people. Jill, talk to me a little bit about some of the positive effects that you've already seen from the work that you've been doing. Sure, well, so one of the things that it's important to know about the Redford Center's work is that our, our mission and our goal is impact forward, it's impact first. The storytelling is the, is the tool and it's the strategy, um, but the, the goal is to you know, get uh, far more people and a far more diverse population of people engaged in this movement towards environmental justice and protection and repair. That is our mission. And so when we, we look for films, um, whether it's to, to produce ourselves or to support, we're always looking for films that have a very specific impact agenda. Uh, for example, Laura and her film Inventing Tomorrow, I mean, she came with one of the most robust impact agendas um, that we've seen and is still actively working on it. There are other films where there's great intention um, and the filmmakers have less experience with impact, so we can come in and help on that front. So it's sort of film to film, the impact, we have over 50 films in our kind of portfolio right now. So the impacts are, are very diverse and on a, a lot of topics. Um, one, you know, one great example that Jamie and I often refer to because it's one of the more um, personal stories it is a film we made called Watershed. This is sort of an example of when you really stay with an impact campaign and the potential of that. This film was really uh, a way to start talking about watersheds, which is something, you know, unfortunately we've sort of lost our focus on actually what a watershed is because we've so altered our habitat these days. Um, we took the story of the Colorado River and really tried to connect the dots for people around who drinks that water, um, what's going on in that ecosystem and all of the challenges and also all of the solutions at play. And one of the big opportunities the film exposed is that the Colorado River Delta, you know, most people don't know that ecosystem has um, has basically dried up. It, this, the river doesn't meet the sea anymore. There's about 70 miles in between the end of the river and, and the its natural end in the Salton Sea. Um, and there's a really great potential for restoration down there that's been looked at and worked on and planned for um, for decades now. And once we made the film, it sort of inspired a lot of these groups on the ground that were doing the restoration work to come together under a singular narrative. Um, so we helped launch this campaign called Raise the River that has to date raised um, millions, over 13 million, and there's a lot more still being raised right now to acquire the water rights and do some on the ground restoration work to really bring that whole ecosystem back to life. And it's one of the most important migratory bird stopovers in, the, in North America, nursing and spawning grounds. There's native people that have lost livelihood. Um, it's an incredible kind of rebound story that's, that we're still actively working on as sort of the storytelling arm of this six, six group coalition um, that the film helped inspire. And so, and Jamie and I have been down there a couple of times. We took a group down last year and it's the only green space within hours of some of um, these communities down there. And so it's created nature access and um, recreation and just, you know, done a lot of really important work. And it's being looked at as an international model because the nonprofit sector was involved in this kind of binational negotiation that's helped revive this, this part of our, our country. So it's been a really, really incredible um, success story, I would say. And the film itself is still, you know, it was, it was on Pivot TV, then it went on to Netflix. Um, now it's being used in schools and it's just, it still has a life. And so I think that's really one of the things that's so exciting about film is a lot of them have these long shelf lives and 
the 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 stories are still relevant years and years later. You both talked a lot about how the Redford Center can find, uh, combines creativity, art with action and with community impact plans. And so I wanted to get into it a little deeper with you, Jill, on just sort of how you select pro projects and what the process is that you go through to, to find the storytellers you want to work with and figure out what community campaign is going to accompany those stories. Absolutely. So I've mentioned some of the things that sort of fall into criteria, if you will. Um, look, looking for that impact potential is you know, always kind of first and foremost. To Jamie's point about the solutions forward storytelling, which can look like, you know, showcasing leadership, showcasing progress, or showcasing innovation, um, it could civic participation. There's so many ways it shows up in the stories, but really making sure that there's a, a pathway forward for the viewer. Um, anytime we're selecting a project is really important to us so that we don't leave people hopeless. You know, there's so much data right now that says we're we're more concerned and more alarmed than we've ever been as a population. And yet people still don't really know what to do. They don't really understand um, what it is that, that's going to make a difference. And so that is the gap that we're trying to fill every day. Um, for us, it's also really important to make sure we're working with storytellers that are storytellers that are either from the communities that they're telling stories about or in a very authentic storytelling relationship with their subjects so that we're making sure that the representation piece um, is intact and that it's not an exploitative experience. I think in particular with documentary filmmaking, that's something um, that's of the utmost important to us. Um, looking for those stories that really do kind of break open the mold of what it means to be an environmentalist and what is an environmental issue. What we're seeing more and more is that the intersection of environmental justice, racial justice, uh, economic justice, gender justice, you can't really separate them. Um, and so finding stories that are that reveal those intersectional uh, points is are, are also stories we're, we're looking for right now. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's got to it's got to be a good story. Uh, so we're, you know, character driven narratives. We are always looking for innovative story <laughs> storytelling approaches, um, artful storytelling approaches, um, fun, funny, all, all the all the things that we can bring to the table to to make sure that people want to watch on its own, you know, as a film. And then they learn something along the way and get inspired along the way is the hope. I don't know, Jamie, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, she's hitting it on the head. I think, you know, it's, um, it's, it's you know, the challenge really, uh, and that's where the artistry is. How do you, how do you make sure that um, the story is engaging in a way that people don't feel like they're being force fed or given some sort of, you know, propaganda or, or uh, too much heavy information. And that falls on all of us. I mean, whether it's a Redford Center original production, uh, that's our charge. And it's the charge for everyone that we support. And we really try and help our, our filmmakers, particularly the, the ones that are up and coming that have a lot of talent. Um, to find that mix and wonderful challenge. Uh, and, but it's really critical as Jill says, because Lord knows we can all, you know, there's thousands of options in terms of how we want to spend our time and what we're watching. So that aspect of character development and the human element, it's just got to be there. It's got to be there regardless of how important the issue is. And since we've talked a lot about generally uh, the type of stories and the types of storytellers that the Redford Center looks for. I think it's a really great time to turn to Laura, um, and I want to make sure we devote some time to uh, going deep on, on one of the stories and campaigns um, that the Redford Center has, has found to be a real success. So Laura, your film, Inventing Tomorrow, as we mentioned, was one of the Redford Center's first grantees, and we actually have a clip of it. So I think we're going to play the clip and then I'm going to ask you some questions about your work with the center.
The sewage that causes this foam mainly comes from apartments. So you can see there's a lot of buildings around here and they release raw sewage into the lake. A lot of the detergents and stuff that people use contain really high levels of phosphates. And all that chemical waste does go untreated. You see, Bangalore will be a dead city in another 25 years because of water alone. Laura, tell me a little bit about what drew you to this story. Well, Inventing Tomorrow is about um, students all over the world who are addressing environmental issues in their backyard. And they come up with science solutions and they all bring those solutions to an international science fair. And um, I was interested in the story because I'm always looking for what's the wrapper that you can bring this, um, these types of stories to an audience. and. It is very difficult to find stories that have a great deal of agency and hope. And that was the goal, was to be able to, to bring a story where people saw solutions being created in front of their eyes so that they are inspired to, to do the same, especially young people. Um, I'd made another film about climate change that focused on activism. And this film is focused on youth and science. And the importance of engaging young people to see STEM as a solution forward, that there's there's so many different ways that you can address these issues, um, not just for climate, but very importantly also for clean water and clean air. And um, it was uh, very exciting to be able to um, go all over the world and find young people to be able to be in the film. and. Um, I think I should mention that when I attended the summit for the Redford Center, at the Redford Center, um, I hadn't shot anything yet. We were at a very early stage. We were still developing it. I was very actively looking for young people to be in the film. And something that the Redford Center did that was really important was they assembled this conference, basically, of people that we could interact with and, and talk with and ask questions and have really interesting discussions. And it was so formative in the framing that I brought into the way that I shot the film um, to meet with people from solutions journalism, to meet with indigenous filmmakers who were working on environmental issues, to work uh, with people who were doing like positive social media campaigns. It really affected the way that I approached making the film and also the way in which I envisioned the impact campaign that we would have afterwards. I mean, how does the experience of making a film this way and working with the Redford Center differ from the other type of, you know, the sort of more traditional type of filmmaking that you've done? Well, I think that um, there's a lot of funders who will just kind of give you the money and then you, you say goodbye. Um, and so um, the difference with working with the Redford Center is, I'm, you know, we had this incredible summit where we were able to meet with all these people. Um, that's very unusual. I think that most funding sources are not putting the effort into doing something like that. And, um, and I think that it, it had, I know it had an impact on me and I, I'm sure it did for every single filmmaker who was there. Um, and then also that relationship hasn't ended. Like we are in touch about what we're doing and we have a, a regular um, conversation with the social media team at Redford Center. So when we're pushing something out, we know to reach out to them and they'll help us um, amplify it on their channels. So the relationship doesn't end, it's, it's ongoing and there's a conversation back and forth about um, you know, what, not only what the film is doing in, in the theatrical and broadcast space, but also um, what the film is doing in its impact campaign. The relationship hasn't ended and your work around these issues hasn't ended either, right? Can you talk a little bit about how you've con kind of continued the message of the film through action? Yeah, so while I was making the film, um, we, we had this very difficult challenge, which was how are we gonna find the students to be in the film? So 
What we did was we spoke to science fair directors all over the world who had a number of students from their country that had been accepted into ISEF. And then we wanted to be able to go film them as they were um, continuing to work on their science projects. And what we found was um, when we were speaking to science fair directors in the developing world, maybe like 60 to 75% of the projects that the students were doing were oriented towards making an environmental impact. When we came back to the United States to look for American students to cast in the film, that number dropped down to 10%. And that gap was so large and there was such a huge disconnect between the awareness and the motivation of students in the developing world versus in the US that we knew, well, that's our impact campaign. So um, what we've done now is um, we're, in the th we're going into the third year of the impact campaign. We started it the first year that we released it in 2018. And um, we continued all through 2019 this year, and we'll be going into 2021. And we, we began it by creating a very um, detailed curriculum that is focused on helping high school science teachers teach concepts and values of sustainability in the STEM classroom. And um, it's, all, it's all engineered around the um, NGSS science standards, education standards. Um, we brought around 10,000 students into movie theaters to see the film um, in 2018. And then we continued to do work around um, creating more ways that we could get this material into the classroom and engage science teachers. So what we're doing now is we've partnered with PBS affiliates all over the country, and we're hosting teacher town halls where we have an Inventing Tomorrow ambassador go in with our curriculum. And the, what they do is they, they basically, they show clips of the film and they talk through what's in the curriculum and they connect the teachers to our remote learning toolkits um, that are found online so that they can really specifically get students to think about what are the issues where they live and how might they use science to be able to address those issues. And we focused all of our attention on um, communities around the country that would be frontline communities. Because the gap in the United States education system is because the, the kind of high level kids that are going to these you know, kind of premier science fairs are mostly coming from wealthier, whiter suburban communities. And so what we've seen that we think that the reason for that gap that's happening is because the kids who are living in the frontline communities in urban and rural areas are not being tracked into these kind of like high level science programs. So it's about how can we engage students in the frontline communities to see science as a solution and see science as a career path for themselves. And this is something that I could go do where I could help create a solution for these things. So it's all about getting the kids motivated to look at the problems where they are, see what they're able to do about it, use science as a way to do that, get their teachers involved and engaged in helping them do that too. And that's really what we've decided the focus of the impact campaign is. And so far we've reached, I think we're in over 4,000 schools now around the US. That's great. I'm so interested in and impressed by the, the work that you, Laura, and the Redford Center are doing. And I think it's such a, a well-rounded and, and really novel approach to, to tackling the climate crisis and the challenges that we face in our environment. So it's been such a pleasure to, to talk to all of you. Thank you so much for your time.